Greetings, students, and welcome back to another lecture on partial differential equations. In the previous lecture, we derived the wave equation for a string and gave some intuition about it. In this video, we're going to derive the general solution to the wave equation. So if you remember from last time, the wave equation in one dimension looks like this. The second partial of u with respect to t equals c squared times the second partial of u with respect to x. And I'm going to label this equation 1. There's two ways we're going to derive the general solution of the wave equation. The first method is longer and involves the transport equation, while the second method involves a very simple change of variables. This video will talk about the transport equation method, and the next video will talk about the change of variables method. Now, the first stage of this longer technique requires that we find the general solution to this first order BDE a times the partial of u with respect to x plus b times the partial of u with respect to y equals zero. Where are a and b are just constants? There's two ways to find the general solution to this equation, which I'm going to be doing on the side. The first way is a geometric method, while the second way involves a change of coordinates. So let's start off with the geometric method, for which we're going to use some of the stuff we learned in vector calculus. For instance, we'll use the two-dimensional gradient operator to say that the PDE in equation 2 is equivalent to the dot product of the vector ai plus bj and the gradient of u. In other words, it's equivalent to saying that the derivative of u along the direction of the vector ai plus bj is zero, or that the directional derivative of u along ai plus bj is zero. Now just to refresh your memory, what do I mean when I say directional derivative? By directional derivative, I mean how quickly a function u changes along a particular direction. For example, if I wanted to know how quickly u changes along the positive x direction, I would take the dot product of 1i plus 0j with the gradient of u. And this would just give me the partial of u with respect to x, which is actually consistent with the definition of partial u partial x, how quickly u changes when you move along the x direction with y held constant. Now what if my vector ai plus bj for my PDE was this unit vector i? In other words, my a was equal to 1 and my b was equal to 0. In that case, this equation is just a specific version of the PDE in equation 2, and we would be solving the partial u partial x equals 0, since this dot product would then be 0. The solution to this equation is pretty simple, it's just u equals some pure function of y. Now, let's analyze this particular PDE even further. And by analyze, I mean, at a geometric level, what does this PDE and its solution mean? It means that when y stays constant, when we're moving in a direction along the vector 1i plus 0j, when we're on a particular horizontal line, the function u doesn't change at all. However, as soon as you change the horizontal line, as soon as you change y, u changes. So we've shown that when this ai plus bj vector is just 1i plus 0j, the general solution to this PDE is just a pure function of y. We can then use the same logic we used to come up with this geometric interpretation to come up with the solution for this differential equation, now with the general parameters a and b. Now since the directional derivative of u along ai plus bj is 0, that means u must stay constant along a particular line, parallel to ai plus bj. In other words, u must stay constant along a particular line given by bx minus ay equals c. However, as soon as you go to a different line, as soon as you change the constant c, then u changes. So what can we say about the general solution to this PDE? That it's a pure function of bx minus ay. Now, what we just discussed was the geometric way of finding the general solution to equation 2. There's a more computational way which involves introducing new independent variables p and q defined in terms of x and y by the following expressions. What we're going to do is replace the partial derivatives du dx and du dt by the partial derivatives du dp and du dq. To perform this replacement, we first need to apply the chain rule. The partial of u with respect to x in terms of p and q is just the partial of u with respect to p times the partial of p with respect to x 
plus the partial of u with respect to q times the partial of q with respect to x. Similarly, the partial of u with respect to y in terms of p and q is just the partial u with respect to p times the partial of p with respect to y, plus the partial of u with respect to q times the partial of q with respect to y. Now using these definitions of p and q, we can plug in the values for their partial derivatives with respect to x and y, and here's what we'll end up with. Now let's take these equations and plug them into our PDE in equation 2. We can cancel these two terms, and after simplifying, here's what we'll end up with. Now, since a squared plus b squared is always positive, except for the case where a and b are both zero, which is just a trivial case we don't really care about, then we can cancel out this a squared plus b squared because it's positive, and we can get the partial of u with respect to p equals zero. And if we integrate this equation once, we'll find that u is just a pure function of q. When we substitute in the expression for q from its definition, we'll see that the solution u is just a function of bx minus ay, which agrees with what we found from the geometric method. So let's go back to the main part of the blackboard where I'll be deriving the general solution to the wave equation. We just showed that the general solution to a times partial u partial x plus b times partial u partial y equals zero is f of bx minus ay. Let's now take the wave equation and begin finding its general solution. We'll start by shifting everything to one side of the wave equation. Now here's what we're going to do. We're going to take out the u and separate it from its operators. Now what we can do is factor this operator expression, and I'm using air quotes around the word factor here. This factored expression I'll call equation 3. Now you might not believe this factorization, but it actually works. You can expand out this expression to end up with the wave equation again. Anyway, let's define a function, which I just found from expanding out this first operator factor on u, and call that function v, which would just be the partial of u with respect to t plus c times the partial of u with respect to x. Let's plug this v into equation 3, and here's what we'll end up with, the partial of v with respect to t minus c times the partial of v with respect to x equals zero. Now we already know the solution to this first order PDE from the general solution to equation two that we found earlier on. The solution in this case is just v equals a pure function of negative ct minus x, which is just another pure function of x plus ct since we can take out the negative one, which is just a constant, so it isn't really of any consequence to the argument of the function. By the way, this PDE that we just solved is a pretty important one. It's called the transport equation, and sometimes also the pulse equation. We can use the definition of v in equation four to set up another differential equation for u, which is du dt plus c times du dx is h of x plus ct. And I'm gonna call this equation five. Now let's go back to equation number three. Remember how I expanded out the first operator factor on u and called that function v? Well now I'm going to do something similar but slightly different. I'm going to expand the second operator factor on u and call that result w. Let's now plug this w back into equation three and here's what we'll end up with. dw dt plus c dw dx equals zero. This guy, by the way, is also a transport equation, except the transport is now happening in the other direction. Again, we know the general solution to this first order PDE from the PDE we solved earlier in equation two, and that would just be W equals capital R of CT minus X, which is just some other function L of X minus CT. And again, we've taken out the negative one from the argument because it's just a constant, and rewritten W as a function of purely X minus CT. We're going to use the definition of w now to set up another differential equation for u. And I'll call that equation seven. And here's our next step. Let's add equations five and seven, and let's subtract equations five and seven. When we add them, we end up with du dt equals half of h of x plus ct plus l of x minus ct. And when we subtract equation five and seven, we end up with du dx equals one over two c, times h of x plus ct minus l of x minus ct. Now because these expressions are just simple differential equations, we can easily solve them just by integrating both sides. 
We'll start with equation 8, and because we're integrating with respect to t, we have to divide out the c and the negative c that appear in h and l respectively. And this is what we'll end up with, with capital H and capital L as the antiderivatives of H and L respectively, and phi of x as some pure function of x. Remember, we're integrating with respect to t, so the constant term that comes out is in general a function of x. Why is that? Because, well, if we differentiate this phi of x with respect to t, we'll get zero because phi is not a function of time, it's just a pure function of x. Similarly, if I now integrate equation 9, but now with respect to x, here's what I'll end up with. Again, capital H and capital L are the antiderivatives of H and L, but now we have psi of t as our constant function of time. Since we're integrating with respect to x now, it stands to reason that the constant we're getting out of that integration should now be a pure function of time. Now these u's that I'm getting should equal each other, because they're both the same solution to the same differential equations, I've just found them using two different methods. And because both of these u's are equal, these functions phi and psi must also be equal. And the only instance where we have a pure function of x equal to a pure function of t is when psi and phi are both the same constant. But if psi and phi were both constant, they could easily get absorbed into one of these functions, capital H or capital L. In fact, these 1 over 2 c's multiplying capital H and capital L would also easily get absorbed into them, and as a result we can write our general solution u as some function f of x plus ct added to some other function g of x minus ct, where f and g have absorbed all these other constants. And this is our general solution to the wave equation. Just a quick note though, these functions f and g, they're arbitrary functions. They can really be any function you want for the general solution of the wave equation. However, these functions do change when you have initial conditions or boundary conditions, as we'll see in a future video. The only other restrictions on f and g are that they have to be twice differentiable. But for the general solution, as far as we're concerned, f and g are just arbitrary functions. It's when you have particular initial or boundary conditions that these arbitrary functions become particular functions as your initial and boundary conditions require. Anyway, that concludes the lecture. We've successfully derived the general solution of the wave equation using the solutions of a couple of transport equations. In the next video, we'll discuss another much more simple way of deriving the general solution to the wave equation using a change of variables. Now, before I end, I'd like to thank my patron, Jacob Soares, for donating at the $5 level. If you're interested in becoming a patron for my channel, I put a link to my Patreon page in the description, and you can support me there if you wish. And that's it. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.